Coming up on Network Africa. A court in Nairobi postpones verdict in the trial of three men charged with helping armed militants launch an attack on a shopping mall in 2013. Malawi's president, Lazarus Chakwera, marks 100 days in office. Plus, schools in Cameroon reopen with students expected to learn in shifts so as to ensure social distance. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Layo Adegoki. Let's begin today by taking a look at some of the stories that made headlines over the weekend. Sudan's power-sharing government and several rebel groups on Saturday formalized a peace agreement aimed at resolving decades of conflicts which left millions displaced and hundreds of thousands dead. Three major groups signed a preliminary deal in August. Two factions from the western region of Darfur and one from the southern region, after months of talks hosted by South Sudan. I am therefore taking this opportunity to appeal to the international community in general and the Gulf Arab states in particular to make good on their pledges to support the implementation of the peace agreement in Sudan needs significant financial resources to rebuild the infrastructure destroyed by the war and floods, and more importantly, to address its glaring development disparities, which have always been at the root cause of its country. Sudan has been rocked by conflict for decades. After the oil-rich South seceded in 2011, an economic crisis fueled protest that led to the overthrow of President Omar Hassan al-Bashir in 2019. In Rwanda, Paul Ruse Sabagina, who was depicted as a hero in a Hollywood movie about Rwanda's 1994 genocide and now on trial for terrorism, was denied bail on Friday for a second time. Rosa Bagina, a Belgian citizen who had been residing in the United States, was also denied bail last month, despite vowing not to try to escape from Rwanda during the trial, where he may face up to life imprisonment if convicted. The political dissident, who says he was tricked into returning to Rwanda, declined to plead guilty to 13 charges facing him and demanded he be allowed to plead to each separate counts. Finally, Egypt on Saturday displaced dozens of coffins belonging to priests and clerks from the 26th dynasty nearly 2,500 years ago, with archaeologists saying tens more were found in the vast Saqqara necropolis just days ago. I'm very proud that this discovery of today with 59 wooden coffins in perfect condition of preservation was done by Egyptian mission and Egyptian hands. This discovery, the entire 59 wooden coffins will be displayed in the Grand Egyptian Museum, the most famous museum, and it's the gift of the century. The 59 coffins were discovered in August at the UNESCO World Heritage Site, south of Cairo, buried in three 10 to 12 meter shafts, along with 28 statues of the ancient Egyptian god Seca, one of the most important funerary deities. Some of our main stories now. A court in Kenya has delayed passing judgment in the case of three men charged with helping armed militants launch an attack on a shopping mall 
in the capital Nairobi in the year 2013. Magistrate Francis Andai says that there are some sections in his ruling that has loose ends that needs to be tied up. He is expected to give his verdict tomorrow. At least 67 people died in the assault on the upmarket Westgate shopping complex. Somalia-based Islamist militants, Al-Shabaab, said they carried out that attack and it's believed that all the attackers involved are dead. Over 140 witnesses testified in the case in which the accused persons denied conspiring to commit terrorism. Well, still in Kenya, the head of the country's police force has ordered the arrest of two lawmakers in connection with an outbreak of violence between rival political supporters that left two people dead and several others injured. In Didi Nyoro and Alice Wahome are accused of hiring people to instigate clashes between supporters of President Uhuru Kenyatta and those backing his deputy, William Ruto. Police Chief Hilary Mutiambai has also ordered that vehicles hired to ferry the goons be tracked and detained to assist in the investigation. Supporters of President Kenyatta and those backing his deputy, Mr. Ruto, clashed outside a church in central Kenya. Well, let's get more on this story from a policy and governance expert, Vincent Kimosop. He joins us now from Nairobi. Hello, Mr. Vincent. Thank you so much for speaking to us on the program. Hey, you're welcome. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Now, what more can you tell us about this clash between supporters of President Kenyatta and his deputy, William Ruto? Um, you have to appreciate that uh, we will be having a transition uh, in Kenya in 2022, when the current president will have served uh, his two constitutional terms. And uh, so what we're having is, uh, uh, is uh, really uh, a succession politicians jostling towards uh, to succeed him. Uh, the president uh, comes from uh, the central part of the country, and uh, they have worked with the deputy president in the current arrangement. And what has actually also brought a different dimension is that uh, the president entered into partnership with the opposition, uh, former opposition leader. So, uh, and it seemed that that uh, partnership in the name of the handshake uh, provided the opposition leader an opportunity to be one of the key challenges uh, to succeed him in 2022. So basically that's the political context. And uh, then uh, what you therefore see is uh, uh, politicians uh, using violence uh, as they try to position themselves and outreach one another. Now, with these clash, with this clash, what what does this say about the relationship between pres the president and his deputy? Um, their their relationship is not good, and uh, and and uh, you don't need to be a skyrocket scientist to see clearly uh, for those who are living in Kenya that the president, together with his deputy. Uh, their relationship, their bromance, uh, that when they were campaigning in 2013, uh, they be called the dynamic duo, the digital duo. They used to wear same ties. Uh, all that now is water under the bridge. A new political dispensation is in the offing. And uh, currently taking a dimension that others are mobilizing around uh, what we call the Building Bridges Initiative, and the other formation is mobilizing, led by the president, by the deputy president. Uh, and their narrative is that uh, any conversation around moving the country forward uh, should be about the the welfare of the local uh, local person. That is what we call the hustlers narrative. So it is really succession politics, and that is what we are facing at the moment. All right. Now, the police has ordered the arrest of two lawmakers in connection with the clashes. Have they been arrested? And what are the accused lawmakers saying about this allegation? Um, yes, uh, the information I have is that uh, from one has been arrested, uh, Alice Wahome, that is the update I got online. Uh, and of course, they uh, will pol politicize this to milk the political capital out of it by portraying that they are going through persecution uh, and that it is because of their political position to be associated with the deputy president, while those they were fighting against who violated with the establishment of the system have not been arrested. So wanting to project the police, that the police is being used for political ends, 
And that is the political narrative that is uh, taking shape. All right, then, Mr. Kimoso, just before I let you go, how are Kenyans reacting yes. to the court's postponement of this verdict into the 2013 Western Gate Mall attack? Uh, not much uh, is, uh, that you can talk about on the public reactions. And I think because of the time that the cases are, are taken and also the many things that are really uh, are a priority to the parts of uh, Kenya. So uh, I would, nothing that I can comment substantively uh, about how Kenyans are taking this. I think they are patient and uh, we will look forward to the, to the, to the verdict. And uh, the reason why that's happening is that in the past, uh, like in the last 10, since the implementation of the constitution, We've seen our judiciary assert its position and, uh, and its independence. So uh, a decision given by the, uh, by the, by the bench is seen to be uh, uh, it's respected and justifiable. So you have to also look at the conditions we're living in uh, to appreciate that uh, uh, that is why uh, not much has been said by the public about the postponement. All right, then. Thank you so much, Vincent Kimosop. Policy and governance expert, thank you for your thoughts on Network Africa. You're welcome. Well, former Burundian Member of Parliament, Fabia Banki Yanion, has been arrested for allegedly planning to overthrow the government. Family members say Mr. Banki Yanion was arrested on Friday after a press conference that he had called for that day was cancelled. The police have not commented on the claim so far. Now, the former lawmaker was a critic of former President Pierre Nkuruziza, who died in June. He opposed the law that created a number of retirement perks for Mr. Nkuruziza, including giving him the title of Supreme Guide to Patriotism. His press conference on Friday was meant to comment on accusations carried by a local YouTube channel that he had insulted the new president, Evariste Indaishimi. Now, the government of Malawi has presented an audit of the first 100 days in office of President Lazarus Chakwera at an event held in the capital Lilongwe, the secretary to the cabinet, Zang Zanga Chikosi, outlined the initiatives approved by the cabinet to ease the cost of production for farmers. Vice President Saulos Chilima also says the new administration is in the process of reforming public service to ensure improved service delivery. President Chakwera vows to unite the country and fight poverty during his inauguration in June. All schools in Cameroon have reopened with students expected to learn in shifts in overcrowded schools so as to ensure social distancing. Some students will learn in the morning while others will report to school in the afternoon. Only primary and secondary school students resume today with universities set to reopen on the 15th of October. Now the government has released guidelines to be followed to prevent the spread of COVID-19. All students, except those in classes one to three, are expected to wear face masks. Hand washing points are also to be provided around the school, school premises. The schools were closed in March as part of measures aimed at combating the virus. <laughs> Now, a group of Zambian miners held by their Chinese employer for five months as a safety measure against coronavirus have been released. Reports say their release on Sunday followed the intervention of a member of parliament. The miners had been held within the mine complex to prevent them from contracting the virus and infecting their Chinese supervisors. The Chinese managers are reported to have left the mine when a delegation of government officials arrived to release the miners. Till date, Zambia has confirmed more than 15,000 coronavirus cases and 333 deaths. You're watching Network Africa on Channels Television, still ahead on the program. The COVID-19 crisis propels homeless Kenyan youth into becoming a rising R&B star. Please stay with us for more. Thanks for staying with us. Africa's traffic-clogged cities make it the world's deadliest continent for pedestrians and cyclists. Now, that's according to the World Health Organization. 
However, that may soon change thanks to a generation of African cycling activists like Ivorian Andy Costa, who have been given a boost by the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to avoid crowded public transport. According to the World Health Organization, Africa's traffic-clogged streets make it the deadliest continent for pedestrians and cyclists. But a new generation of cycling activists like Andy Costa from Côte d'Ivoire thinks the momentum is now with them. Lockdown restrictions and the need to avoid public transport have focused attention on cycling, but for Costa, it was wider health concerns that propelled him into action. When I used to go to school, we just had one kid who was asthmatic in my class. Today, in our children's classes, 50% are ill with asthma. So it really demonstrates the negative impact the environment has on health of our children. Our environment is really polluted. Last month, after 10 years of campaigning, authorities told Costa he could help plan bike lane in part of the commercial capital, Abidjan. The mayor of the Plato Central Business District said the lanes are part of the solution to make roads more fluid and improve health. You know in developed countries, they are part of the solution to make roads more fluid. Even for health problems, they are part of the solution, and I think we should be doing it. The commune of Plateau is not a big commune in terms of surface area, so it would be good to start here. But Costa is not stopping at that victory. He says his aim is to change the perception that cycling is for the rural poor and his organization, My Dream for Africa, make videos with celebrities such as soccer star Drogba. He started with Côte d'Ivoire, he says, but the vision is to make the whole continent more cyclable. The South African government says it will give priority to women and youths in a new program to lease idle state land. President Cyril Ramaphosa says women who were allocated farms under the existing proactive land acquisition strategy had run them, had run them successfully and moved into commercial production. He adds that it is important to ensure land leased for farming is used for that purpose and that farmers are supported to boost production. The new reforms will see 700,000 hectares of underutilized or vacant state land given to farmers. Now, South Africa's Congress of South African Trade Union, COSATU, is calling for all workers across the country to stay at home in support of what they call the National Socio-Economic Strike this week. While the strike action will primarily focus on the wage dispute, the Federation also wants President Cyril Ramaphosa to speed up prosecutions of corrupt individuals. The Labour leaders have threatened and now it's all coming to a head. They say they are mindful of COVID-19 and so the strike has been adapted to fit safety measures required. The Congress of South African Trade Unions, COSATU, an umbrella body, is encouraging workers to exercise their right to challenge and contest what they called a rigged economic system. The workers need to unite in defending jobs, fighting corruption, as well as shortcoming of the law enforcement agencies in fighting corruption and gender-based violence. We need to fearlessly express our determination to protect the integrity of collective bargaining and to resist all attempts by employers to undermine it. The workers are to implement the work to rule principle, a form of protest in which employees do exactly what is stated in their contracts and nothing more as a means to slow down production. The work to rule campaign. In other words, because we know that uh, there's a there's a chronic shortage of the public servants in the various departments, workers are going to work only for that which they're employed officially to do. No going of extra mile, no doubling up. As I, I've made an example on Friday, <clears throat> that uh, you have uh, nurses that are doubling up as porters or doubling up as cleaners. We're saying not again shall that happen when 
there is no incentive that uh, recognizes the fact that these workers are doubling up. In, in other cases, people have going to protest. In other, people are saying they're going to be leading some small marches. In other areas, people are saying they're going to be doing a motorcade. So they are going to be driving slowly, arriving there, handing over the memoranda. The, the intention is to just make a symbolic thing that this thing must be tackled at all costs. About 1.3 million workers began a work go slow from lunchtime on Monday and the strike is expected to come to a head on Wednesday, the 7th of October 2020, when unions will embark on a full-blown national strike if no compromise is reached. The COVID-19 crisis has propelled a once homeless Kenyan youth to become a rising R&B star in his country. After a stranger heard his voice and recorded him in March, the start of Kenya's lockdown, Kenyan R&B artist Ray G's life began to transform. For most of the past three years, up-and-coming Kenyan R&B artist Raymond Undungu Jane slept under a bridge at the edge of Nairobi's Uhuru Park. Since becoming homeless after a family tragedy at the age of 12, he scraped an existence from informal work and the generosity of passers-by. Things were stable enough this year for Ndungu Jane, who performs as Ray G, to be in the mood to sing for his friends. In March, a clip of him crooning a Justin Bieber cover went viral across social media, just as the start of the lockdown pushed Kenyans to spend even more time online. Actually, I used to sing for food. Yeah, I didn't sing like, I didn't think that I'd be in a studio like this one day. Nah, I didn't think I'd miss all this all one day. All that was a dream, and it all came true. And I like God for that. By the end of March, he got his second big break and first real paycheck, with a feature on a government-sponsored awareness song about the global health crisis. They helped me out for, for a while, about food, about clothes, and all that. I recorded like three songs for them, and actually it boosted me, because they paid me a little cash, so I had to sustain my life with that. In September, Ray G released a song with one of his idols, popular Kenyan singer-songwriter Viri. With those proceeds and help from producers with whom he now works, Reiji moved into his first apartment and invited two of his friends from the streets to join him. He also helped others to stay afloat and connected them to centers helping homeless youths. And that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Adegoke. Okay.